Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Forgotten Weapons. Thanks to a ton of you guys for tuning in to Forgotten Weapons. I have hit a million subscribers here on YouTube, which is really phenomenal. Honestly, I don't think it ever occurred to me when I started this that there would be anything even remotely close to that. So it's really awesome and exciting uh, to hit a milestone like that. It's, it's really cool. In fact, it's cool enough that it deserves a beverage, a drink. Uh, and in fact, I think it also deserves a cool piece of new artistic swag. We've actually had this one in the works for a little while, and when I realized I was getting really close to a million subscribers, I thought it'd be a really cool tie-in just to kind of do the two at the same time. So what would be a more appropriate cocktail than a French 75? French 75. Put up a whole row of those, Sasha. And we have a cool new shirt to go along with it, the French 75 shirt. Now, the French 75, of course, is the French model of 1897 75 millimeter artillery piece, which was a truly revolutionary piece of artillery uh, at its time, right before the turn of the century. And it's something that France took into World War I thinking it really had the best, hottest, awesomest, perfect artillery. Now, what made this unique is, or what made this fundamentally transformative is kind of in the same vein as the LaBelle rifle and its smokeless powder. Specifically, the Model 1897, the French 75, was the first artillery piece to actually go into production and modern usage that had a recoil mechanism. So prior to this, a cannon, while they had maybe breech-loading guns, well they absolutely had breech-loading guns, fundamentally the cannon was fired just like a cannon from hundreds of years earlier. When you pulled the lanyard on the thing, the projectile goes out that end, and then the whole gun rolls backwards on its wheels. And because it's just a barrel fixed into a carriage, and so then you have to roll it back to its firing point and re-aim it, and then reload it and fire it again. And what the Model 1897 in introduced was a, uh, a, a hydro-pneumatic recoil system, meaning that just like a self-loading firearm, uh, the, the whole barrel assembly slid backwards on a mount that was com uh, controlled by air, compressed air and oil and springs so that the gun itself didn't move. The, the wheels stayed in place. Uh, at the same time, they also introduced wheel chocks to hold the wheels in place, and the whole idea of basically a spade trail where you dig the back end of the gun into the ground to ensure that it doesn't move backwards. That was something you simply couldn't do before that because the gun had to move. If you tried to dig the back end in, the front end was going to lift up, it might break it, bad things were going to happen. The, that movement of the gun was necessary to absorb the recoil. Well, now the recoil is being absorbed by the whole barrel mechanism moving backwards, just like, uh, just like the bolt on a self-loading firearm. Now this was still a single shot gun, however, in addition to this recoil system, it had what's called an eccentric screw breech which was really quick to operate. So the idea of an eccentric screw breech is that you've got a, a round gun and you've actually got the barrel up here, and then you've got a breech block that rotates and it's got a hole down here. So when it's closed and the two holes don't line up, the breech is sealed. And then you can rotate the back end of this thing open and the holes line up, and then you can eject the empty shell and load a new shell in it. And in practice, this meant basically you pull a handle up, out comes the empty case, automatically ejected, you slam a new cartridge in, close the, the handle, just that kind of motion, and the gun's ready to fire again. You don't have to relay it, you don't have to re-aim it, all you have to do is throw a new shell in, pull the lanyard, and fire. And for the French, this, well, this was legitimately a tremendous advance in artillery technology. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't quite as good as they thought it would be. Um, they took this idea, this recoiling action in an artillery piece idea, and they applied it specifically to a light field gun, a 75 millimeter. They had high explosive and shrapnel uh, shells for this thing, and it was really well suited to the philosophical basis of the French army in that period up to, you know, from about 1900 up to World War I, which was light, mobile, always on the attack, um, you, you would never need to dig in, you would never need to be on the defensive. The idea is that elan, uh, morale, superior morale and will to fight, uh, would overcome things like 
firepower. Well, this turned out to be a tremendously flawed idea, as they would discover in 1914. And unfortunately, in 1914, uh, they had no heavy artillery. They had sp deliberately not made heavy artillery, because it just didn't fit the mold of what they expected to be doing. So they went into World War I with a, just over 4,000 of the, the 75mm Model 1897 guns, the French 75s. By the end of the war they would have made 21,000 of them, and in fact the American army, as well as a number of other countries, would also adopt this gun. Because while it was of somewhat limited utility in trench warfare, because it didn't have the high angle of howitzer, it was a relatively light gun compared to what would be developed during the war, uh, it was excellent as a light field piece, and, and so a lot of countries used it for that, and it worked really well. But the French would have to go on and develop, kind of on a rush basis, uh, some heavier artillery to go along with it. So that is the French 75 artillery piece, and it is, of course, also the basis for the French 75 cocktail, which is really quite tasty, and I'm going to go ahead and make a celebratory one. So uh, we are going to start with, this is in effect, gin, lemon juice, sugar, and champagne. So I have some lemon here. I've already put some powdered sugar into my measuring cup, because it just wasn't really convenient to do it any other way. So we've got super fine sugar in there to uh, ensure that it's nice and easy to dissolve. Never use granulated sugar in a cocktail, because you'll inevitably end up with uh, bits of it at the bottom of the drink that haven't dissolved, and thus it hasn't done its job. It's supposed to dissolve to sweeten everything. So we've got lemon juice and some sugar. We're going to go with two ounces of gin. This, by the way, is... Uh, there, there are a lot of variations on this cocktail recipe. I'm using the one uh, from Dave Wondrich, who's a fairly noted cocktail writer and historian. Um, I'm also using Plymouth Navy Strength Gin, which is going to kind of kick this up uh, a bit more than it might normally be. So we've got two ounces of that. And we're going to go ahead and add some ice to that to chill and properly dilute those elements. Stir that up here. Should be able to see some condensation form, some frost form on the bottom of the shaker jar here. You'll notice on the shirt, uh, this is in a cocktail or in a champagne flute, which is one way to do it. Uh, the, the modern way, perhaps, is to actually build it in a Collins glass, so that's what we're going to do. So we will now take our Collins glass, add a bit more ice into that. Normally you don't grab the ice with your bare hands, but this is my hand and my drink, and that'll work. Now we will go ahead and strain into there. And then, of course, the most important ingredient, champagne. The cocktail itself actually dates from the 1920s. The first, uh, the first recorded instance of it, of a cocktail named the French 75, was by a guy named Harry Macalone, who was a bartender for, uh, well, he ran, owned, and bartended for uh, Harry's New York Bar in Paris. And that was printed in, I believe, 1922. Um, however, it was a substantially different recipe from this. This recipe first appeared uh, in a published cocktail book in 1927, um, and of course it, it's virtually impossible to trace the history of cocktail recipes, because they're all relatively similar, and uh, you can never track exactly what came from where. However, uh, this very much has the, uh, the, the, the connection back to World War One, and it was very specifically named for the hard-hitting, rapid-fire influence of the French 75. That smells good already. Move that up there. Give this one little stir. 
just to make sure we've got everything mixed together nicely. And there we go, one French 75. It is very good and deceptively strong, kind of like the gun itself. Well, thank you guys for a, a million of you for subscribing to Forgotten Weapons here on YouTube. Um, we do have some cool stuff going on, um, some of it coincidental at this point, and some of it specifically related to hitting a million subscribers. If you're still here, you are definitely a fan of the channel, and you may be interested to know that we are actually running a Blitz two-day sale on some of the merchandise on the Forgotten Weapons merchandise store as a celebratory, congratulatory thing for hitting a million subscribers. So I believe that is going to be uh, hoodies, sweatshirts, and the polo shirts. Um, I got a lot of requests for a polo shirt for a very long time, and I actually used the, the polo shirts that I wore uh, for a very long time in the videos. I sold a very limited number of those as an early fundraiser uh, to help raise the money for early camera equipment. And uh, at the time, I promised people that that would be a one-time only thing and that they would never again be available, and true to my word, they have not been. Um, however, we do have a polo shirt with the Forgotten Weapons logo on it, so if you're interested in something other than a print t-shirt, those, along with some hoodies and, and other winter-themed sweat, sweatshirt-type stuff, uh, are on sale starting right now on uh, December 9th and running until December 11th, so just a little short-term sale on that. In addition, one other cool thing going on that I should have mentioned a long time ago, that is good, um, is you can also find Forgotten Weapons on Amazon Prime. Now, I've partnered up with a friend who is taking Forgotten Weapons episodes by theme and compiling them together into one to two hour long segments, kind of more in the, the theme of the movie sort of uh, content that I think people are, are expecting or, or more likely to be looking for on Amazon Prime. So if you're interested in Forgotten Weapons compilations, definitely go search for Ian McCollum or Forgotten Weapons on Amazon Prime, and you'll find we've got something like 60 compilations up there right now, and there are always more coming. So that's a, a cool, exciting uh, expansion. Uh, just in case YouTube does decide that they don't care how many subscribers I've got, they want to put the kibosh on the channel, well, that's another place that we'll have as an alternate and a backup. So if you're the sort of person who enjoys browsing on Amazon Prime, it's all free to watch there and without ads, as Amazon Prime is. So got some other cool stuff coming, uh, hopefully, but I don't want to jump the gun. I don't want to talk about it until it's definite. What I can tell you is absolutely definite is that there is an awesome pile of material coming in December. I think you guys will really like it. And of course, the long-awaited, by me as well as you, the long-awaited Heckler & Koch uh, G3, or uh, G3, G11. See, it's already hitting me. The long-awaited G11 video will be coming on Christmas. So thank you all very much. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next time.